Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, on behalf of everyone here at the Center for Brain Health, we want to welcome you to the fall kickoff of our Frontiers of Brain Health series, where we take a deep dive into the most exciting new developments in brain research. I'm Dr. Julie Frattentoni. I'm one of the neuroscientists here at the Center. And for those of you who don't know much about us, the Center for Brain Health is a cognitive neuroscience research center of the University of Texas at Dallas. And we have dedicated the past three decades to exploring neuroplasticity and the brain's amazing lifelong potential to get stronger and work better. So I hope you can stay till the end so that you can hear about our groundbreaking research study, the Brain Health Project. Um, but now I would like to introduce you to our speaker. Dr. Mary Helen Imordino Yang studies the psychological and neurobiological basis of social emotion, self-awareness, and culture, and their implications for learning, development, and schools. She's a professor of education at the University of Southern California Rossier School of Education, a professor of psychology at the Brain and Creativity Institute, and a member of the Neuroscience Graduate Program faculty at USC. She's also the director of USC's Center for Affective Neuroscience Development learning and education. Uh, Dr. Emordino Yang has received numerous awards and accolades. She's on several editorial boards and is an associate editor for the award-winning journal Mind, Brain, and Education. Um, her work's been funded from many different organizations from NIH to DARPA um, to private uh, funding and more. And she's also published a book called Emotions, Learning and the Brain, Exploring the Educational Implications of Affective Neuroscience. I got the chance to meet Dr. Imordano Yang a few years ago and hear her speak at a conference. And I immediately knew that we had to have her come speak at Brain Health. Um, the way that she's thinking about and researching the adolescent brain, learning, inspiration and motivation, how emotion and cognitive Mission work together, um, bringing in intergenerational interventions. There's so much synergy with um, our mission and so much that we can learn from her. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mary Helen and Mordino Yang. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Um, can you hear me okay, Julie? Yeah. All yes, right. we can hear you. Well, so thank you so much for having me. It's it's such an honor and it's really a pleasure. And I, um, it, it's wonderful to be able to contribute in a small way to the conversations that you're having um, at the uh, Frontiers of Brain Health series about this really important issue of, you know, how do we think in a really more complex interdisciplinary developmental way about health and brain health in particular. So um, with, with that, I'll just launch straight in. So um, can you see my screen, my slides? Yeah, great. Um, okay, so I, I'm just starting my talk as I, as I sometimes do with um, a painting, right? I think sometimes artists, have a really prescient way of showing us um, not what we're going to find scientifically, but kind of uh, what our scientific findings sort of mean from a cultural perspective. And, and so I'm showing a painting by my colleague and friend Margaret Lazari, um, who uh, was the chair of the fine arts department at, at USC when she made this, um, what in real life is a gigantic seascape of, of you know, six by eight feet, vibrant color. And, um, you know, if you look at this seascape, you might see these little kind of white squiggly things in the middle. You might think they're, um, you know, they look kind of like waves or uh, maybe like uh, reflections of the clouds. What, what they actually are is the white matter brain data from, uh, you know, one brave <laughs> participants, um, you know, imaging scan that we did uh, here to study the structure of individuals um, brains and how those structures are related to the way in which uh, uh, people experience the world, the cultural shaping of those experiencing uh, processes, the educational shaping of them, the individual variability in them, the ways that young peoples and, and, and adults um, thinking and feeling are sort of emerging from but also driving uh, the changing organization of their brain and the structures of their brains in ways that I think have really important implications for, um, for health, uh, for mental health in particular, but also uh, for learning and psychological and sort of psychosocial health, if you will, the ability to, to, to succeed as a productive citizen in society, to be happy, to flourish. Um, and, and so what I love about this painting as a place to start the discussion is that 
you know, Margaret hasn't painted all the connectivity and the, and the little networks inside this person's brain, which really represent the sum total of this person's, you know, uh, evolutionary legacy, her genetic uh, legacy, her, her biological growth, um, and also her psychosocial experience and development shaping these networks. You know, she doesn't paint these in kind of a bucket in the corner where we can put on our special science glasses and, you know, get out our p-value scale and start studying what's going on. She, she paints them instead kind of floating in a, in a seascape of, of life. She paints them with, you know, sort of being bolstered up and sloshed back and forth by the ecology of the world around the, those networks. Um, you know, little weeds poking the bottom and, and warm sunlight shining on the top uh, and, and little red fish swimming by to represent the spontaneity of our creative ideas. Right. And, and it's that way that she paints the growth and the development and the functioning of the brain. And and I use this to really highlight that we often think of brains as being inside people's heads and sort of out of reach and separate from the rest of the world um, and, and sort of hidden inside them. But actually, our brain development, like all of our physical development, happens in the ecology of the world in which we live. And, and part of that is the cultural and psychological and emotional and relational ways that we engage with that world. Um, and, and if there's anything we've been learning over the last you know, decade or two in neuroscience and in epigenetics and in you know, multiple fields kind of converging on the notion that our development is, is inherently and deeply context-driven and dependent. Um, and it's also inherently and deeply driven by the constructive processes of the person experiencing that development. So we're not passive recipients of things that influence us in the world. The influences of the world on the brain uh, are, 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 are there because of the person's active adapting to the circumstances in which they live. And when we sort of flip the discussion around brain health and development and young children's growth and development and what this means for education and mental health services and things, over so that we focus on the constructive experiencing and the growth processes that the individual is subjectively engaging. Um, it gives us a new view into the ways in which we might think about these constructs and support them and study them. So I put up next just a picture of, of you know what, of a, of a new mom and her teeny, teeny infant. This is not me. I don't put pictures of myself in my slides, but it's my sister and my niece, right? And, and you know, the, the, there's so much to talk about in this photograph, but the reason I, I show it is just to highlight again, you know, my baby niece Nina here is about two hours old uh, in this picture. She's about, uh, you know, five and three quarters pounds, like she's teeny. She was a twin who was born prematurely. And this is, you know, this is the first time that she and my sister have met each other when they're both awake because there was an emergency C-section involved where everybody was anesthetized. And, you know, what I want you to notice is the deep sort of agency that Nina brings, that my little niece brings to this, to this interaction, right? My, my sister is supporting her posture, her arms, her you know, and, and, and there's all this background support that's happening that you would only notice if you were a parent, right? Like uh, she's fed, she's warm enough, she's awake, uh, she has a clean diaper, like all the things that set up the context such that Nina can then bring to the world these biological and evolutionary predispositions. Um, you know, in this case, the most obvious one is this is this uh, tendency, right, that's this reflex that's built into the visual cortex um, to stare at two dark dots, right? Dots in this kind of configuration, not this way, not three, not, you know, moving, dark dots like this, right? And she'll automatically engage with that if she's sort of in the mood, right? If the context is set up to be conducive, um, you know, not if she's hungry or sleeping, right? Um, and then what my sister does, what the world does, is then respond to that, optimize the opportunity for that, right? By setting up the appropriate, just intuitively setting up the appropriate distance for Nina to be able to foveate effectively, right? To be able to see well, um, because newborn babies, you know, see best at about eight to 10 inches away. So intuitively, my sister's adjusting the distance, um, given the cues that Nina's giving her about how well she is engaging and whether or not she's actually able to focus her eyes 
on my sister's eyes. And all of that dyadic dynamic complexity is the legacy and the uh, potential of our human development, that our brains, our minds, our skills, our dispositions, our emotions, our feelings, are deeply organized by the interactions that we have with people and in a world. Imagine for a moment just the cultural aspects of this photograph, right? How this same interaction might look different in a different cultural context or in a different time, right? Or in a different place. All of these factors organize the ways in which we grow and learn. And that is the essential thing we need to keep in mind when we study the development of the brain and when we study uh, the ways that brain development is, is, is related to uh, mental propensities, including those around wellness and those around learning and education, which I'm particularly interested in. So don't try to read this unless you're like a kindergarten teacher or uh, you know have a kindergartner at home. I'll, I'll read it for you. But, but you know, I'm kind of jumping ahead to show you again how this process that Nina has demonstrated kind of the beginning of starts to be cognitively and emotionally elaborated, culturally elaborated using the skills that a child learns um, from the resources in their environment, from the people around them. But then they, what they bring to it is this kind of inner agency to make sense out of what's going on, to represent the sense that they're making, to formally um, kind of document that in whatever ways they can and whatever ways are available to them and are sort of culturally appropriate in the time and the place in which they live. So this is a little um, song that my daughter uh, wrote for her baby uh, baby brother when she was, I don't know, six or something like that. Um, you know, and what she's got at her disposal is some paper, uh, crayons, right? And, and then she starts to represent the meaning she's making and is sort of compelled to do so as an exercise in, in both leveraging the, the, the proto-academic skills she's learning as a kindergartner, you know, how to kind of write and, and compose ideas in a formal way um, by, by, you know, uh, jotting them down, but then also the pictures she drew and the little, you know, the music stand there, right, tells you something about the cultural heritage in which she's uh, doing this. And there she is standing and in her pink dress and shoes, which actually she didn't have pink dresses and shoes. She didn't really like those things, right? She liked brown. But anyway, you know, to her, that represents kind of a formal showing of, you know, here's me uh, uh, performing something that feels really meaningful that I have built. And, and I won't sing for you. Okay, I'll just read. But she says, oh, Teddy. So Teddy is uh, her brother Theodore, she calls Teddy. Oh, Teddy. We love you more than the whole earth size. As the earth spins every day, we love you as much as usual, but sometimes even more, as you make us proud and happy that you're you. I mean, oh, how sweet, right? But let me ask you a, another simple question. You know, is this a song about this little girl's love for her baby brother? Or is this a song about her, her budding uh, knowledge of planetary science, right? It's both, it's absolutely both. And now I'm happy to report that this little girl is a, is a university student studying planetary health, right? I mean, you know, what Nora's shown us here is that she's bringing her academic skills and her subjective experiences of relationships in the world together as a way for her to make meaning out of the the kind of experience that she is having in the world. She's leveraging her academic skills and her relationships and resources in the service of her own meaning making. Um, and it's that process that is inherently the one that drives human experience of the conscious sort, I would agree. And we're gonna call that learning how to feel, learning how to build cognitive constructions and narratives around the experiences, including the emotions that we have in the social and physical world. So the big point here is that emotions are automatic responses to situations, that the actual physiological changes that Nora presumably uh, enacts, right, as she engages with this baby brother that she loves and with her parents that, you know, become part of the we who love this baby, right, 
those things she doesn't need to consciously control. She doesn't need to change blood pressure and you know ad ad adjust to the kinds of cortisol levels and things in her blood on purpose. That happens as a kind of physiological regulatory package that goes together to produce or undergird a kind of mental experience, a mental experience that becomes cognitively elaborated based on the opportunities and the cultural knowledge and the developmental stage of the person. So what we see here is that Nora is learning how, I would argue, to, to sort of consciously construct a meaningful story around how she experiences her relationship with her baby brother by bringing in something else that to her feels the same, feels relevant. So she's learning about, right, from her science geeky parents, how we're living on this gigantic planet of dirt, right, spinning around every day and the, and the sun is the star and we're going around it. And as that happens, we see day and then we see night and, right, and all of that feels so huge to her. And then she thinks, and the other thing that's really huge here is how overwhelmingly I love my baby brother. Oh, wait a minute. That must be kind of the same thing. Maybe these two things are actually the same concept. Let me construct a cognitively complex narrative in which they're integrated. And that's what that song to me represents. And this isn't something you only do when you're six years old. This is the nature of human meaning making throughout the life course. We become more and more elaborate in the ways we do this, more and more disciplinary specialization of the tools we have for thinking and as those tools become integrated into our processes of engaging with the, with the evidence and the, and the experiences we have in the world, those narratives actually generatively grow us over time and produce the psychological health, but also the intellectual and scholarly and community and citizenship health that we most want for our young people. So I'm gonna quickly show you a brief uh, a video clip that comes from a Nova episode that we were part of, just to give you a sense of how we do our experiments with teenagers, um, that I'm about to show you some of the data for how teenagers react to complex emotional stories in the world. You know, we put together real documentaries of real teenagers from around the world and ask them how they feel about those. And then we basically um, analyze those in-depth interviews and use kids' own meaning-making processes, the emotions, the cognitions, the ways in which they make sense of things and relate that potentially back to their own life, back to broader lessons about how the world works, that those dispositions to engage in those kinds of mental and emotional meaning-making uh, we're now showing instrumentally predict brain growth over time above and beyond IQ, above and beyond uh, family socioeconomic status, and parents' education level. Um, and so it's a really powerful statement for the role of the individual in engaging in complex, curious meaning-making as a force that both results in, uh, in, in psychological growth and well-being, young adult happiness, our data show, and purpose, and, uh, and also in actual structural and functional growth of the brain. Hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Mary Helen. Nice to meet you. Since her days as a teacher, University of Southern California neuroscientist Mary Helen Imordino Yang has been interested in knowing how emotions factor into learning. I quickly realized that there was very, very little known about the kind of stuff that we really care about in education, like how people become inspired. How do we become interested in things? How do we build curiosity? And how can we support that process? <laughs> in trying to identify which parts of the brain are involved in the deepest and most meaningful learning, Imordino Yang works with teens from troubled neighborhoods. We're going to be watching stories. We really want to know what you think. So there's no right or wrong answers. These are kids who see a lot of crime, they see a lot of dangerous things, they see a lot of poverty. And we wanted to understand how do they make meaning of that world around them. This first one is a story about a girl who lives in Savat, Pakistan. 
and the city was being taken over and basically run by a group called the Taliban. Um, so I want you to watch her when she was 12 years old. First, she gets them emotionally engaged in a topic by showing them videos about people struggling to overcome adversity. I want to become, become a doctor. <laughs> so how does her story make you feel? Um, this story makes me feel upset how she wants to be a doctor and continue on with her education, but it makes her sad that knowing her journey would be very difficult. For adolescents, these types of stories can trigger moments of deep reflection. They come back from those kind of reflective moments with this heightened appreciation of the meaning of the story and what it applies to in their own life and what it means for the nature of the world more broadly. And it's crazy how it's that powerful. Whereas we've known that for a long time in education, the neural data are giving us new insights into the mechanics of that process. Come on over here. To find out which brain regions are harnessed during reflective emotion, Imordino Yang monitors the students' brain activity as they re-watch the emotional videos in an fMRI scan. Hi, Estella. How you doing in there? Good. So we're looking at the movement of the blood flow in her brain as she's watching the stories, and where in her brain is becoming more and less active as she's experiencing these emotions. She found that the reflective thinking caused by these emotional videos triggers widespread activity throughout the brain. The most high-level brain states that people experience in the scanner don't just activate high-level systems. They also activate lower-level structures of the brain that are involved in regulating and monitoring your consciousness and your survival. Imordino Yang believes that the reason why learning and emotion seem so intimately connected is because complex emotion, like admiration, can activate basic brain functions, like those regulating breathing and heart rate. We think that the reason that humans' values and belief systems and ideals are such powerful motivators is literally that they're hooking themselves into biomechanical machinery that has evolved to keep us alive over time. So emotions are a critical piece of learning always. Meaningful learning, learning that really matters to you, that changes who you are and that endures over time, always has an emotional component. So I would draw upon any of these. Like Her research shows that engaging students on an emotional level makes for more powerful learning experiences. Okay, so you get a sense, like there's not a lot of complex science in that clip, but you get a sense of kind of how the experiments are run. So we work with kids from various backgrounds by really sitting down with kids and spending actually a whole day talking to them about all kinds of issues in their life um, and, and also engaging in a two hour long interview in which we ask them to reflect on, you know, what, how, how a story makes, a, a series of stories make them feel, real true stories about teenagers from around the world. And, and, and what we show is that feeling complex emotions involves brain systems for feeling and regulating the body and for constructing a sense of self. There's now a lot of neuroscience uh, that points in that direction. Um, you know, just like, this is Nina's older brother here, right? Just like my little nephew is showing his mom as she's taking a picture of him in a mirror, right? We use our own experience of self as a kind of springboard or platform on which to construct narratives about the meaning we're seeing in the world. And as we construct those narratives, we are also driving and shaping the neural systems and the physiological uh, embodied systems, we think, that are undergirding the, the, the actual experience of the physiological changes that power these mental processes. So it's a very deeply embodied and also culturally and socially agentic model of human, of human development. And so I'm gonna take you just uh, into the, some of the brain data. These data are from adults. The first study we used with this method that came out in, in 2009, it was basically my postdoc work with 
Antonio and Hannah uh, Damasio. And, and what we showed in a, in a very sort of basic way is that emotional engagement activates the same brain systems that keep you alive. When people are in the scanner reacting to these stories again, and they push buttons to tell us how strongly emotionally engaged they are with the story right then and there, as soon as they know. When you know how you're feeling about this, push a button to let us know. Um, and you know how strongly are you, are you feeling right now? And we've now done this work with teenagers. We've done it longitudinally with teenagers. We've done it in young adults. We've done it in, with young adults in China. We're doing it in Switzerland, right? We're looking at cultural shaping, developmental shaping, and individual variation in the ways young people do this and what that means for the way we set up and structure educational opportunities uh, for our young people to learn to do this in advantageous patterns. Um, so, so what we show, this is just a contrast between uh, uh, when people said they felt really strongly about these complex emotional stories compared to when they subjectively said, I don't feel particularly strongly about this right now, right? Um, and what we're showing in orange is the places in the brain where there's relatively more blood flowing, which corresponds to relatively more neural activity um, in the systems uh, that are turned orange uh, when people are subjectively emotionally engaged with the story as compared to when they uh, aren't. And, you know, the first thing to notice is that, you know, there are robust activations, even controlling for physiological uh, noise for those of you who are in neuroimaging, right? We're also measuring psychophysiology and we can use that as covariates and all kinds of things. There are robust and very um, uh, reliable activations in subcortical regions that are involved in, uh, you know, in survival and consciousness in the most basic sense, right? You get, you get damage down here in this uh, spot in the medulla and, you know, we get you get, uh, you, you get uh, complete dysregulation of, of the physiological survival systems of the body. You literally can only keep you alive on life support, right? Um, so this, I think, is a, just a very deep and poignant uh, lesson for those involved in mental health and education that you know, these experiences we have, they run deep. They're really shaping the physiological reactions and functioning of our bodies and of our brains as we engage with them. And we also see activations in regions that are involved in sort of mapping the states of the body, somatic sensation for the viscera, right? The feeling of your guts inside you, right? The anterior insula, for those of you who, uh, who aren't uh, neuroscientists, is, is, you know, has been known since the 1950s. If you poke around up in here, right? Wilder Penfield and his colleagues showed during uh, neurosurgery experiments with individuals with intractable ep epilepsy, um, you know, if you poke around up under my cursor there, you get basically all kinds of visceral responses. The person vomits or, or shows other kinds of gastromotoric distress, right? And, and what our experiment showed is that, and now many, many studies have shown, is that you get robust activation in these visceral somatosensory regions when people are subjectively experiencing in an agentic way emotional or, or complex reasoning and thinking that feels motivating. And you know, we also get these robust activations in other regions that are involved in regulating physiology and, and, and arousal and autonomic nervous system and stress, but also kind of cognitive orienting, right? And, and, uh, and, uh, and switching of complex networks in the brain for different modes of engagement and thinking. So the anterior middle cingulate you know, can most directly be thought of as kind of that network that goes <gasps> when you like get surprised or when you notice an error, right? When you're learning a math problem, say, but also if you're involved in something really traumatic, right? Um, and it's it's a, a kind of a, of, a, of a ramp up station that sort of organizes the networks of the rest of the brain, shifting us into other modes dynamically other neural activation modes that allow us either to kind of engage with the world right then and there and, and look at what's going on and ramp up motor control and, and sort of think of strategies to manage um, and, and complete tasks and things like that, um, alternatively or shift into a kind of more free form inner directed mode um, that's associated with another network of the brain, which uh, has been called um, the so-called default mode network. So we're basically uh, activating in these uh, experiments uh, neural systems that map body states and arousal, so-called salience network regions, for those of you who are in neuroscience, 
Um, and also we're finding these very intriguing activations in regions that are associated with something called the default mode network, which is you know, deep inside the head uh, and also some lateral parietal regions that are involved in, um, that, are, that are very deeply activated when people are daydreaming, when they're sort of thinking in a transcendent way, when they're reflecting on things basically that are not in the immediate here and now, um, when they're uh, uh, engaged in direct uh, watching of the environment around them, when they're moving their pencil on the paper, when they're in school and it's one, two, three, all eyes on me, right? Uh, then you, you deactivate these regions um, on average, right? And, and uh, activate instead these regions that are more focused on external attention. And so the question becomes, how in growth and development does thinking deeply activate and regulate and leverage the development of these regions. So in essence, what we think is going on is that deep thinking, including around emotional issues, including around self-related issues um, and, and bigger concepts and understanding in disciplinary context, we think also, right? Like the notion of planetary science, right? That my little daughter is thinking about. Um, that those kinds of transcendent thinking, if you will, thinking that transcends the, the real current physical uh, and motoric and empathic uh, reality of your uh, immediate social and physical context, that that kind of transcendent thinking and being able to adaptively and appropriately move in and out of modes that support that kind of transcendent thinking and deeper meaning making, which is also involved in episodic memory formation and, and all kinds of really essential mental processes, that being able to move between these in a coordinated adaptive way is key both to intellectual growth and to mental health and well-being. Um, so that's, there's a lot of evidence that kind of uh, integrated together makes us think this. I started to uh, spell out this argument in a 2012 paper in Perspectives on Psych Science, which you can read uh, if you're interested. Um, and now much more evidence is also coming to bear on this and we have better understanding than we did, but the big idea definitely holds. And so the question is, you know, if the brain and the mind are, are if regulation in, in, in children and, and adolescents especially is about being able to adaptively and appropriately pivot almost like a seesaw between kind of the outward focus, dig in, engage with what's here and now, uh, interact with people appropriately, be empathic, uh, move your pencil on the paper, get stuff done, make plans and carry them out in a goal-directed way on the one hand, and step back, reflect on the broader meaning. Wait, why am I doing this? What's the purpose? What's the even bigger purpose of my whole life? Who am I, right? Who are these people? How do I make sense of this girl in Pakistan who got shot in the head by uh, the Taliban and now she, because she kept going to school? Like, what does that mean for how the world works, for who I am in the world, for how the world should work, for what I stand for and what I believe in and for who I am? And that kind of toggling is where we think that um, uh, regulation is, is really, <laughs> really needed and and we're trying to understand how kids experiences engaging with big ideas uh and with instrumental actions here and now and empathic relationships here and now how practice moving themselves between those realms appropriately um is actually growing them over time and and so the big idea here is that we have a kind of two big notions that are in, in, at play with each other through development. First, that emotional feeling states, the subjective experience of emotion recruits neural systems that map visceral body states and arousal and regulate those visceral body states and arousal. Um, and that emotions, uh, second, rely on these kinds of abstract inferences that reduce, that, that uh, recruit brain networks whose activation is suppressed, is, is disrupted when uh, uh, you're engaging in task orientation and external attention. Um, and so what this means is we need both and we need our young people to be able to adaptively move between those. And there are all kinds of uh, you know, mental health uh, problems that are associated with over-reliance on one 
right? So anxiety, for example, is, is, is kind of engaging overly vigilantly with the world and with oneself and visceral, right? On the other hand, ruminating, right, or depression can be associated with hyperactivity of the default mode, right? We need to be able to advantageously and appropriately move ourselves between those. And, and for those of you interested in education, I think many of our education practices, even our most cherished and dearly held uh, structural uh, 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 practices in the education system, um, don't just uh, fail to support kids kids growing abilities to move themselves appropriately between kind of big ideas and instrumental action and back again, um, we, we actively punish it in many ways. Um, and the kids who succeed best in some of the most traditional environments are the ones who are uh, really not uh, being encouraged to learn uh, uh, self-regulation into and out of these states. Um, and so what we see, we think, is, you know, a lot of uh, anxiety problems and other kinds of mental health issues, even in the most high performing or especially in the most high performing uh, students. So it's a it's a very complex problem that we're just beginning to tease apart. But I'll give you some more of the evidence for this. So I'm going to take you quickly back to this girl um, who has answered in the Nova episode, but I'm going to have you go beyond. Uh, what she said in the Nova um, to engage with the ways that she made meaning. Um, and then we're going to look at how those characteristic ways of making meaning are associated with adolescents' brain development over time and with their young adult outcomes. So she says, um, this story makes me feel upset, how she wants to be a doctor, continue with her education, but it makes her sad that knowing her journey would be very difficult. And it's crazy how it's that powerful, right? All of this beginning information there is very context dependent. She's basically recounting what was in the story. It makes her sad, her knowing this, and she continues in that, right? But then she signals to us, I'm gonna shift to something deeper here, um, something powerful. Something is moving me from the inside around the meaning I'm making. And she goes on to say, I mean, it makes me think about my own journey in education, how I wanna go to college and hopefully be a scientist someday. And even more, I guess what really hits me is how not everyone's able to get this chance to go forward with their life. I mean, it's not right. I guess when I think more, yeah, it makes me feel upset that um, others live in like certain parts of the world where they don't want people to learn or they are trying to hold them back. But then uh, her story like inspires me, like all these pauses, right? To, uh, well, like work harder so I can uh, prevent those things from happening maybe. Everyone everywhere should have the chance. I mean, all human beings should be able to live free and choose their future. So what has Isela shown us here? There's a kind of concrete meaning making, if you will, a sort of direct empathic engagement with what you can directly observe. And that's important. And we show that that kind of meaning making is associated with good relationships and you know, all kinds of factors in a kid's life uh, here and now. Um, but she also shows us that she's willing and able and disposed, if you will, to go beyond that kind of meaning making that's direct and empathic, right? To talk about these bigger notions, these how the world work notions, what it means for me and my psychological dispositions and growth, right? And what's generally true that I stand behind or believe in about everyone everywhere, not just this girl in Pakistan, right? And not just myself for that matter. And what we show is that kids' propensities to do this are loosely but not statistically significantly associated with IQ. So higher IQ, uh, the higher the IQ, uh, marginally more of this blue kind of abstract talk kids do. But what's really interesting is that the brain growth that we can predict becomes even more uh, robust statistically and neuroanatomically when we control for IQ, which basically means that it's kids' dispositions to engage in deeper and more complex meaning making than their IQ would naturally make easy for them to do, if you get what I'm saying, right? And it's that engagement and pushing themselves to engage curiously with perspectives and complex understanding that we can show is growing their brain physically over time, right? From time one to time two over a two year window from age 15 or so to age 17 or so, we can predict the growth in the kid's brain based on how much they talk in this blue way relative to this yellow way. And that in turn 
uh, uh, predicts their young adult outcomes, how happy they are, how much they like themselves, how coherent their identity, right? How much they really uh, uh, report that they know what they believe in and who they are. They know what they stand for as a person uh, uh, as compared to, you know, I don't know, I just kind of go along with the crowd. What everybody else thinks is good, I just kind of do that, which we know is associated with poor mental health, with poor outcomes in all kinds of ways. So what we basically show, so these are the real kids from the experiment, um, in the brain is that the more a young person engages in the, 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 the yellow kind of talk, the, the, the very concrete engaged talk that's predictive of good relationships in your life right now, right? So you need both, right? Of, of um, uh, liking yourself, liking your teachers and your friends. Um, the more activation you get in these yellow regions in the brain here, which basically uh, are the executive control network. So we think the executive control network is instrumentally involved in helping kids manage themselves in the here and now um, and sort of engage empathically with the people around them. And, and that's really important. But the more they engage in that kind of abstract, broader meaning making that we have in blue, the more they uh, activate the default mode network uh, when they're in the scanner thinking. And we have a new uh, paper that was just accepted at uh, SCAN at Social Cognitive Affective Neuroscience, which describes these findings um, in, in a lot of detail if you're, if you're interested. Um, but the basic idea is that the coordination between these two networks, the early activation of the executive control followed by profound deactivation of executive control relative to a kid's own mean level of activation across the experiment, right? Coupled with activation of the default mode network and, and this part is critical, even more so when kids claim to be experiencing strong emotion about what they're thinking about, the strong emotion coupled with, that, with the default mode activation and the early activation followed by the deactivation of the executive control is predicting trial by trial the level of abstraction that the, that that youth showed to the story. In other words, it's predicting the degree to which kids are likely to make this kind of broader transcendent meaning. And then in turn, that transcendent meaning is associated with psychological growth. So this is just a, a kind of, uh, you know, quick model of what's happening. But what we basically see longitudinally starting at age, you know, average 15, between 15 and 16 up to age 21, is that the ways kids talk abstractly in the interview is uh, predicted by the coordination of these two networks over time, and in particular, the deactivation of the executive control. So it's not just about putting the kibosh on negative thinking, it's about getting out of the way, marshalling your mind into this bigger, broader frame, and then getting out of the way so that you can kind of think out of the box, we think, right? And that in turn predicts over a two-year window the change in the connectivity, the crosstalk, both anatomically using fractional anisotropy uh, measures and, uh, and functionally at rest in the brain, right? The ways that these two networks are coordinating with each other at rest as a kid's just laying in the scanner and thinking about whatever they want for seven minutes, right? We're predicting the degree to which there's change and positive growth in the connectivity between those networks. And then in turn, that about a year and a half or two years later um, is predicting how uh, how kids are doing in terms of their identity achievement in, in Erickson's sense, right? How much do you know who you are, know what you believe in, right? Feel good about yourself, like yourself, right? Have good relationships, like your partner and all that. And, and negatively predicting identity diffusion, right? How much you feel like, you know, whatever goes, I don't know. I, I, I just kind of doing it day to day, but I have no big purpose in mind, and I'm not particularly happy. Right. So we also see, just quickly as I wrap up, that we see structural development in the brain being predicted by uh, this abstract talk over that two-year window. Um, so IQ predicts uh, development in some regions, and most notably the medial temporal lobe, regions involved in uh, sort of memory formation and semantic, uh, semantic processing, right, and, 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 and memory retrieval there. But we see abstract talk above and beyond IQ predicting, uh, predicting uh, 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 cortical thickness across the growth in cortical thickness, I should say, right? Across uh, regions of the brain that are involved in all kinds of complex 
regulation, reasoning, and emotion. These are just really quick data that, you know, literally we showed this analysis yesterday at lab meeting, right? Showing that uh, abstract talk above and beyond IQ and SES is predicting uh, the fiber track uh, change, uh, fractional anisotropy increase from uh, from uh, age 15 to age 17. And, you know, just quickly to give you a sense of what this looks like in kids talk, right? Here are kids who are part of a science program that we ran at the lab, uh, you know, who are reacting to, um, uh, you know, our question, you know, what's a neuroscientist to you? What's a scientist? When they came at the beginning of a three-week camp and at the end of a three-week camp, were they engaged in doing neuroscience with us, right? And at the beginning, the kids are saying things like, good at science and math needs to be able to answer all questions and have the periodic table memorized and know everything about anything. It, it's very efficient. It's all about speed. That's what a scientist is, right? Or a person who worked in labs all day, taking info out of rats, or a person with glasses that's skinny, right? Uh, they don't have proper health and they're tired and weak looking, right? A nerd, antisocial, did not like having much fun. I always wonder why kids signed up for a three-week summer neuroscience camp funded by the National Science Foundation if this is what they think scientists do. But anyway, um, right? It's very appearance-oriented, very concrete. It's very here and now. Um, after uh, three weeks, same kids say, can walk into a subject blindfolded, explore, eventually become an expert is constantly working with instruments, which may come with no set of instructions. <laughs> Funny how that works, right? Uh, but just persevering, sticking through it until it works out. Almost completely opposite of what I used to think. Not, all do not only do scientists not spend all day in a lab, but they're constantly engaged with other scientists. They collaborate their research, very engaged, very open, cares about others and what others think, cares about their ideas. Any person who's curious, right? So it's not true that being curious makes you a scientist. Um, you need a whole lot of disciplinary knowledge and experience too. But boy, being curious is a way better place to start than wearing a white lab coat and being fast, right? They've shifted to an appreciation, I would argue, of the inner psychological capacities and qualities, the things that are hidden and that are transcendent in the person that make you a scientist from the immediate um, outward actions and appearances. So to sum up, emotions are, are automatic, right? What happens in your body you don't directly control but we need to learn how to construct narratives and feelings out of that, because from those narratives and feelings come the seeds for neurological growth, for mental and psychological health, and for intellectual growth and achievement in school. Um, this is our, uh, our center, the Center for Affective Neuroscience, Development, Learning, and Education. You can follow us on social media and learn about what we're doing. You can go to the website and grab stuff, and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Emerdino Yang. Absolutely fascinating work. Um, we have about 10, 12 minutes for questions. So we'd love to hear from you in the audience. You can type them um, into the Q&A and we can go through those. And while you are thinking about your questions or just um, taking in all this incredible information, I actually have a question. So in terms of, you know, we do, we actually, here talk a lot about abstract versus concrete thinking. And those are some of our measures that we use when we uh, think about measuring things like innovation. And, um, and so I'm curious with the education piece, if you found certain ways to bolster abstract mm. thinking and what, are, what were specific things maybe you did during that camp that um, to help with that shift? Yeah. No, that's a great question. And, and we actually have a, uh, you know, a couple different kinds of work right now that are showing how you might bolster these things. And we're also actively uh, collaborating with really progressive schools, um, working with a range of you know, kids from a range of demographics and cultural groups that are also, we think, bolstering this through really smart educational practices. And I've, I've written a lot about that. So there's a, there's a paper in educational leadership, which I can send you the link to, which people can also look at to get a sense. Um, but, but what I'll say is there are a couple ways that we have actually instrumentally, experimentally uh, increased kids' abs tendencies to abstract thinking across interventions. What were those? Um, one was um, uh, the science summer camp. And, and what did we do there? Like we didn't intend to change abstract thinking. We did not talk about abstract thinking directly, but we talked about our own identities as scientists. I had all of my lab assistants and my postdocs and my students 
introduce themselves to the to the high school kids. And these were very, very low SES high school kids, I should say, like kids living in homeless shelters, kids, uh, you know, who were really in some pretty dire situations. Um, and and the, the National Science Foundation was completely funding the camp. So I was able to pay for their books, pay for them to come by cab, pay for their lunch, everything. Right. But what we did was really kind of situate them in a university setting and make them feel like scientists with us. We gave them real data. We let them work together to um, conduct experiments on each other and then try to figure out, hey, uh, how could you as a Korean American kid, right? We don't say as a Korean American kid, but how could you as a first gen Korean American kid um, engage with this African American kid around the story of your grandpa and what he means to you and what happened when he died and how you feel in a way that's gonna move that kid's bagel tone, right? As we've got, right? How are they, they were engaging with each other around these complex issues and watching the measures and trying to figure out together what's going on. We basically designed a, 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 a curriculum in which they would derive emotion. They would try to figure out what emotion is and how it's related to thinking was the idea. In doing that, they naturally had to move themselves between like, let's try it. What happened in the data? How do you feel right now? What am I noticing, right? And um, wait, what are we trying to accomplish here? Wait, what does all this mean? How are we doing this again? And who am I in this space? And as they engaged back and forth with that toggling, driven by themselves, but supported and, and kind of uh, orchestrated in the task, they naturally came to notice and, and to feel like science is actually a process of transcendent meaning making around complex ideas and curiosity. So that was one example. Another example was something that we ran uh, over the last couple of years, including through the pandemic with a partner group called Sages and Seekers, um, which does amazing work pairing together elderly people with teenagers from the same neighborhoods um, in this kind of speed dating thing where they need each other and then they pair themselves up and they make friends. Basically, it's not a mentoring program. It's a storytelling program where both people are bringing things that matter to them from their home lives and explaining them and trying to help each other make sense out of who they are and what their life has either been about as the elderly person or will be about if you're the teenager. And what we show is that teenagers, um, it was really quite fascinating actually, the teenagers begin quite concrete in the things that they're talking about. How did, how was today make you feel? Like give us a little video diary about that. And they were like, oh, it was really fun. Like. Ellis is really a lovely person. She was so nice. And we had all these fun conversations. I've never had such fun conversations with an old person before. Right. And then like over time, they start to shift into this like, wait, she's making me realize that, you know, they can't stop me from doing what I want to do just because I'm in this. Right. And then they come into like and now I realize like the world is like this. And to do that, you need to be this kind of person they spontaneously are explaining those things to us as they reflect on their learnings in a little video diary they keep, right? So we're seeing kids shift. And as they do that, that mediates like changes in purpose in life and happiness and motivation and growth mindset and all kinds of things. So those are two examples. Amazing. Okay. We've had some questions come through. Um, one of them was asking that same question, which is great. And then let's see. Um, thoughts on how this applies to, so this was, you know, low SES or poverty. Um, what about uh, autism I, spectrum or other, yeah, I, other, other um, yeah, or just really from healthy or more um, clinical populations? Yeah, those, those are great questions. So, so I'll start with the healthy, uh, high SES, high achieving kids, right? Um, and that work isn't done yet, except I have a healthy, high achieving ISES kids, and I've been watching them and their kids, their, their friends, really closely. And I, I really think that this is a universal thing, right? And it has been described behaviorally and psychologically for a century in that demographic and the higher SES, higher achieving kids, right? This is, these are not new ideas that, oh my gosh, teenagers start to think abstractly and transcendently about identity and big issues and they become all idealistic and, and, uh, and emotional about that stuff, right? That, like I didn't invent that idea, right? Um, and so I would love to conduct parallel and embellish sort of um, experimental uh, longitudinal studies with a range of demographic groups of kids in there to look at how this plays out in different ways in those groups. Um, so that's the first question. But funders really want to fund low SES stuff, which I understand. But I think can really understand how we're going to promote equity in society. We need to understand all kids. 
Um, and we really need to understand how do we also make high SES kids um, develop in ways or help them develop in ways that will facilitate a more just society overall, you know, engaging with others' perspectives and that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's the answer. The, the sad answer to that question is it's all hypothetical at this point. Um, but then uh, uh, the answer about autism, I, I also I, I have been studying typically developing healthy kids because I, I, I feel like they're understudied, especially in these populations. Um, but, you know, what we could say about autism, you know, we know something about the neural correlates of, of autistic uh, symptomologies, right? Um, and the kind of difficulty that those kids have on average overcoming kind of sensory, you know, sensory stimuli becoming over, over, you know, over activating to them and also getting kind of stuck in default mode, um, uh, you know, activation patterns in the brain and having a harder time being flexible shifting themselves into the here and now and back out again, but also that autistic kids uh, tend to be deeply lonely and 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 deeply craving of complex uh, and warm social relationships, but they have a, a difficult time knowing how to appropriately um, build those with other people or express themselves well. So I, I, I think, but we haven't studied autistic kids here, that, you know, autistic kids also need to do this, but that it's maybe um, harder for them, given the neurology they have and the psychosocial profile they have, and it's going to take a lot of support and uh, and help for them to really be able to do that. And that's what good therapy already is doing for for those kids. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned studying, you know, different cultures in a few different countries, and so would love to hear a little bit more about what you're finding in differences across the world. Oh, yeah. So we have some a, a series of papers that are comparing the neural correlates of these complex emotional experiences in, for example, Beijing Normal University students, right, who are, um, you know, urban, uh, mid, mid to high SES, high performing kids, right, um, and uh, USC students who are that same demographic, but uh, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and and what we basically showed, although you can read the papers, uh, there's a series of papers in Frontiers in, uh, in, uh, and, uh, and Emotion and a few other uh, journals, but you can find them on the website. Um, what we basically showed is that the brain activity, right, for complex, deep emotional experiences was not different across these groups at all. And we also, I should say, had a group of second generation East Asian American USC students, right? So, so they were their parents were born and raised to adulthood in China, uh, but they uh, started school in the U.S. by the age of six. So they are being raised, if you will, by Chinese parents, but in an American context, and they are hybrid effects in the brain, which was really interesting. And it kind of argues that this isn't a genetic effect; it's uh, it, as much as it's a cultural a developmental effect, right? Um, but what we showed and then replicated was that the, the brain activity levels were the same in like key regions of activation. And in fact, all over the brain, they were exactly, they were not different, I should say. But the real time correspondence between neural activity fluctuations in different sectors of the anterior insula and anterior cingula and the person's experienced strength of emotion at that moment was, uh, was robustly shaped by culture. In other words, the brain activity itself is not different. But the way that brain activity is kind of utilized by the person to construct a conscious experience, that was different. And we were able later to show that we could actually uh, uh, explain that cultural group difference in the correspondence between neural activity and people's experience um, by looking at their expressiveness in the interview. So we had just like um, research assistants code uh, people's reactions to stimuli that we had mixed in there that were uh, of people physically injuring themselves in accidents, right? Um, you know, like, you know, somebody step off the curb and twist their ankle or something like that, right? And these are all real stimuli, you know, off of YouTube and stuff. So we, we put that there and then asked them, you know, um, how does this person's story make you feel? We turned off the sound and the, the research assistants coding don't know whether they're reacting to a control story, which isn't that emotional, or a kid getting hurt. And then they, they rate the degree to which the person like flinches or shows like a big reaction. And what we showed is that there was a main effect of culture on the magnitude of that expressive reaction. You know, Chinese people were on average less reactive, but there was the same amount of variability in all the groups. And that variability in all the groups explained the degree to which their um, the neural activity correspondence to experience looked more like the American one. So in other words, the more expressive a person, the more they seem to use visceral somatosensory cortex to know how strongly they're feeling, 
the more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, calm the person, uh, the more they seem to use regulatory mechanisms to know how strongly they're feeling. Um, and this is even controlling for psychophysiology and all kinds of other, you know, um, uh, neuroanatomical correlates and things like that. So you can look at those papers for the details. The basic idea, though, is that we learn how to have experiences of our reactions um, uh, in part based on the kind of cultural meaning that we make out of our own uh, embodied uh, feelings. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Amardini, thank you again so much. Oh, for thank you for having me. Talk. Um, this is, yeah, this is really a treat for us to get to have you virtually visit us. Um, a couple notes in closing. I just want to wrap up and um, really say that research like this and the research that we're doing, the power of this really lies in how we're using it to make the world a better place. And so that is really the impetus behind um, the Brain Health Project, which is our landmark study. And um, the goal is to help people everywhere get proactive about maintaining and improving their brain's health and performance. And so if you're interested in learning more about the Brain Health Project or possibly participating, you can scan the QR code here on the screen, or you can visit thebrainhealthproject.org. Um, if you are interested in getting continuing education credits for these talks, you can go to our website, centerforbrainhealth.org slash CEU. Um, thank every, thanks to everyone again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you back here on October 15th with Dr. Michael Platt from the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks, everyone. Take care. We work we live, we innovate, and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis, as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever, stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here.